<laughs> I'm yeah. psyched. I know, this will be so good. Woo! Woo! It's a great, great day. It's a good day. Welcome back, risers and survivors. We are so happy to have you with us today on the Rise Today Inspirational Podcast, where we serve to open up the conversation about hardship and to really share tools to stay the course and to best navigate hard days. And we are here. We are so lucky to have Brian Bashan from Evolution Evolution serve as our incredible guest host. And we are here with Temi Ayodeja, who is going to open up the conversation about um, best parenting children on the autistic spectrum. And Temi serves as uses science-based artistic methods to help overwhelm parents and spouses care for sick loved ones and reduce their stress, reframe their obstacles, and overcome life's challenges. Brian, will you please help me welcome Temi to the show? Absolutely. Temi, it's such a joy to have you here today and especially to learn about you, your background, and how your inspiration of art impacts the world. So thank you for joining today. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Erica. And it was a pleasure to meet you too, Brian. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just so honored to have you here. And I have to tell all our risers. So I just had the best call from Temi just the other day. And she has just undergone this amazing transformation herself and which she will definitely open up the conversation about as well, because this is also perfectly time for our show where we really share those raw and authentic stories with you of overcoming our own personal obstacles. And Temi has struggled herself with alopecia for years and she has forever worn a wig. And as you see, she has just come out of the gorgeous, radiant, bald woman, shining her colors from inside and out. And then, gosh, I just, I'm so inspired by you and just your, how you radiate this beautiful, how you radiate this beautiful energy. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and thanks for taking that phone call because um, just to let everybody know, I called um, Dr. Eric around 11 o'clock at night, our time, which was about midnight where she's at and I, I had to give her a call because last Thursday um, I'm actually writing a book called Sweet Seeds of Hope and mm -hmm. in the book I'm sharing the journey that I've undergone with my family the last 15 to 20 years um, where I have been a caregiver to my son who's on the autism spectrum and I also homeschool him and during that time my husband unfortunately ended up um, having or developing renal failure which for people who don't know that means his kidneys were not functioning anymore and he needed to have a kidney transplant. Mm -hmm. um, but in the process of that, three months later, he was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. So it was, here I am, a mom at home, having to take care of my son and my husband, be a mother to my son and be a wife and a supportive spouse to my husband. And we have another son that I have to be a mother to him. But um, thank God over the years, we've there have been so many challenges that we've overcome. And the book is just to share with you know, other parents and other caregivers that you can overcome. My son has done phenomenally well and I give God the glory for that. My husband is now cancer free mm -hmm. and he has a new kidney, which I gave him last year through mm -hmm. a matching system. So it's just a book to inspire. So while I was writing that book, I was on a chapter where I had to share a technique that I had used years ago to overcome the unfortunate diagnosis of having alopecia. But as I was writing it, I realized, wait a minute, I'm sharing something with my future readers, but they know me as a woman with hair. And I felt like a fraud and I was struggling and I just started crying and crying and crying. And um, a day later, I was still crying. But when my husband came back from work, I had a beautiful smile on my face because I just didn't want him to know I was struggling with this. Uh, but Thursday was the last straw. And I said, I'm doing this. I don't, I'm afraid of what the world would say. I was afraid if my husband would be comfortable with me standing with him outside in public. I have sons. I was afraid would my sons be embarrassed to see their mom who the world knows with her beautiful hair and beautiful smile now be looking bald like them. Those are legitimate pains and struggles and things I struggled with last week, but I overcame it and I had to call Dr. Erica to let her know, um, I'm coming on to your show next week looking bold. I look completely different from the girl, you know, from the mugshot that I sent her. And I just didn't want to, you know, blindside her. And she was 
amazing. And thank you, Dr. Erica, because when you came on, I thought the first thing you would say is, what happened to you? <laughs> but you just, hey, how are you? And, <laughs> and I was like, so, and I was nervous. I don't know if you remember, I was like biting my nails. And you said, are you okay? And I'm like, uh, can't you see what's going on? You're like, see what? <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, thank you, God, you know, for, you know, people like, like you, Dr. Erica, for just not even making it a big deal. And um, I've, I'm just excited. I'm happy to share that. And also to share, you know, what I've been able to do with my son over the years. And it's not just my son that it's on the autism spectrum, but for his brother as well, because he's what I'll refer to as an atypical child, extremely intelligent. Um, but I had to make sure that he didn't feel left out especially when I had to teach him as well in the summer when I homeschooled him. So um, I just got a lot to share with you guys and um, just let me know where, where you want us to take this conversation to. Well, we are so happy to have you. And when you called that night, I happened to be in my son's room, in my youngest room. And yes. the first thing I showed Temi was, because I'm all about showing our true colors, right? And shining our true colors forth each and every day. And I, we were on a video call and I just, turned my phone around and I showed Temi this photo of myself with my youngest. Um, I had been his biggest cheerleader on this day that this photo was taken. And it's a photo of me having blue hair down to about here. <laughs> and um, it was just the perfect moment to be, you know, like I'm happy to have you on this show, bald with red hair, with blue hair, with, you know, anything. You just look so radiantly beautiful and you are shining from inside and out. So you have just warmed my heart in so many ways. But yes, please take us back. So share and open up the conversation about your, you know, all that you've been through, parenting, all of your kids, but in particular, your son on the autism spectrum. Sure. Um, I have two boys. They're 20 months apart. Um, I'll just take it back to how it started. And I had normal pregnancy, normal deliveries with both boys. And I was about to start my PhD program in occupational therapy because I love it so much. Uh. And, and incorporate art with therapy was to me something I was really looking forward to. Uh, so we went on a vacation to Hawaii. And the day we got there, uh, was a day that things changed. Unbeknownst to me, that was when autism literally was knocking on the door. And it happened when we were in front of the microwave, you know, two little boys that looked like little rugrats, same height, people thought they were twins. And I always give them milk every evening, chocolate milk. And I'll press the 30 seconds on the, the timer on the microwave. And they both took turns counting down every day. And mm -hmm. this particular day, I pressed the 30 second button. My older son, Andrew said 30, Matthew just looked. I can demonstrate the look. He just, he just had that look like he was being, it was in the chance. So my other son said 28, Matthew didn't say 27, 26. And I continued to do the countdown. I didn't know. I just assumed maybe it's jet lag, you know, change of scenery. That's why he wasn't responding. But over the next few days during the trip, I just noticed that Matthew wasn't really responding. And when I say responding, what I mean was he wasn't as active, playful. He was there, but he wasn't, it was like he was in his own little world. And when we, he wasn't saying much, we went to the beach, he screamed, he didn't want to, you know, put his feet in, in the sand. Little things, little subtle things that when I think about, those were the telltale signs that he was having some kind of, you know, sensory issues, but I wasn't thinking about it. When we came back home, my son ended up squeaking he wasn't even speaking. Mm -hmm. I remember my husband saying, he sounds like a prehistoric bird. We joke around a lot. And um, I knew this is not adding up. There's something wrong. And I couldn't diagnose my son, but I knew what it was because I had worked in the Boston school system when mm -hmm. I was in school for OT. But I could not accept that he had, he was on the spectrum because he was fine just three weeks ago. Um, so Cut the whole story short, for a whole year, I did not hear my son speak. And he received his diagnosis of PDD-NOS, which is a form of autism, which basically means he doesn't have severe autism, um, but neither can we say he has Asperger's, which is you're on the spectrum, but you can speak, you can communicate. Mm -hmm. He wasn't communicating, but neither, he had also lost his ability to have eye contact. So in other words, Okay, I'll use this as an example. So you could call me and I'm looking over here, but you're right here, but I'm looking through you. Um, and, you know, I can, he, I could turn his head, but he never gave me that eye contact. I hope I could demonstrate it properly mm -hmm. um, for you guys. So um, 
we had an evaluation about 15 months later and the speech pathologist said, oh, you didn't tell me that you were using sign language to communicate with your son. I said, excuse me? No, I'm not, I, I, I don't know how to sign. She said, he's been sign language, she's, he's been signing to me in there. And I said, what do you mean by, what do you mean? I was confused. So she called me in and right there and then, I saw her turning my son in the chair, like the chair that I'm sitting on right now. <laughs> and I wanted to tell her, woman, um, he just had lunch. He's gonna puke and it's gonna be projectile and I'm not gonna clean your office. And as she was doing that, I heard him say, I heard the word stop. And I looked around, I knew that was his voice because I remembered that voice from a year ago. And I started shaking and I started crying and she directed me to sit down. And when she stopped turning him, he had this giggle from his gut that I hadn't heard in such a long time. I can tell the story without crying. And I was just like, this is my son. He's, he's laughing, he's connecting with someone. And that was with her. And she told him, I'm not gonna turn you unless you tell me to turn. And he kept giggling. <laughs> and I heard, turn. And she turned him again. So trust me, that was the beginning hmm. of that transformation of my son. And I made sure for years after that day, I would make sure that anybody that worked with my son, even took care of my son, was someone that believed that he had the ability to get better. Yeah, I'm one of those parents that I can walk into. I used to walk into daycares and I'll say, do you think or I'll see a therapist and I say, do you think my son is capable of, you know, getting better? If they said, well, you know, you never know. I'll say, OK, thank you. I'll schedule the appointment, but I'll never go back. Mm -hmm. The reason why is because that person has some degree of doubt. And if you have that amount of doubt, I know it's bigger than that, but you're just trying to pacify me. I don't want my son to see you because as far as I'm concerned, you've already limited his ability, his potential. And well, as far as I'm concerned, the sky's the limit. In, 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 a very, in a very different way. I totally understand where you're coming from on that point. And I know on my own personal health journey, um, this too was very important to me that everyone coming into my hospital room time and time again, whether it was during my leukemia prognosis, whether it was during my two month terminal prognosis, having been denied all further treatment, whether it was during the bone marrow transplant, the double lung transplant, no matter it, where, what stage I was at, I needed everybody that walked in to know that that treatment would be effective. And I'm not a fool, right? I totally get that there are consequences that come in tow, but I needed that headspace to be 100%, this is going to be effective, right? And I had one physician that, he was, he was, I'm still really great friends with him, but um, he would come in all the time and say, I hope this works. I hope this works. And for me, I'm, I'm a big believer in hope, right? But in terms of the treatment, that had to be, this is going to work, right? Yes. For my mindset to be, and, and for everyone else is in that room to be 100% focused on that, this is going to be effective. Yes. And um, whether you didn't choose those daycares or for me, whether I fired these physicians because I literally did, I, I stood true to what I really needed for my heart. Um, I think that's really important on our journey, right? To, to create our tribe as we need and those that build us up in the ways that we each personally need. So mm -hmm. I really admire that you supported your child in that way as well. But take us back to that year, right? In that time that must have been so hard. Like you feel you can't get that connection with your own son. And tell me what it was like. What were you feeling in your in your heart as a parent in that time? I'll be, I, okay, it's gonna. I I felt guilty. Yeah. I felt. And when I say I felt guilty, is because, ooh, you asked a very important question there. Um. Okay. <laughs> this is hard. When my oldest son was born. You know, my mom always said, it's good for you to breastfeed your child. So I breastfed my older son. And when my younger son was born, I felt some lumps in my breast, which I thought was breast cancer. So I was only able to breastfeed my younger son for about four weeks. Hmm. So I had assumed that because I did not breastfeed him long enough, I did not give my son the necessary nutrients as an infant. He was unable to combat this. There are different things that mothers think about when things yeah. go, when things happen to their children. Mm -hmm. And I had that guilt of what kind of a mother am I? 
God blessed me with this boy. You know, I've always said I'm going to have two boys, Andrew and Matthew, and I did not do what it what I needed to do as a mother. It didn't matter whether I thought I had lumps in my breasts. It was just I did not do what I needed to do as a mother. And then I doubted God. You know, I just went through this self condemnation and it lasted for over a year. And um, during that time that I said he didn't speak, it was... I had, okay, people who are watching right now that are from our from our town, they're going to know this. I lied for a whole year and a half that I had allergies. We live in Dothan, Alabama. They have peanuts and a lot of people have allergies. But I was, I had a PhD in lying and saying I had allergies because mm -hmm. I was always crying. Mm -hmm. So I had a justification for having red eyes. And the reason why I was always crying is because when people would ask me, how are you boys? I said, oh, they're doing great, you know. They were not doing great. I mean, one was, but the other one wasn't. And I just felt I, I couldn't tell them what was wrong with my son because it would be the, bless your heart. Oh, really? And I'll get all this bunch of unsolicited advice that would not help me or they'll make me feel more guilty. So I, those those were trying times. And it was it was it was an experience that when I look back on and I see new mothers, or mothers who are just in those early stages, I can relate to it. And I don't, what I do typically is hear what they have to say. And all I need to say is, I completely understand. Mm -hmm. I went through it. Yeah, having somebody tell me back then that they went through it would have helped, but mm -hmm. I didn't have much of that. I had, and mind you, I was using homeopathic remedies for my son. I refused to put him on medication. I was already blaming myself. I thought, oh, okay, I did not. It was the fact that I didn't breastfeed my son that he has autism. Oh, um, I think it's the immunization shots that he had that caused you know, the neurological damages. I was blaming everything and anything. And you know, I just didn't have, and there was no answer. You know, there's till today, people can't, there, there's no answer as far as what is the cause of autism, but there are a bunch of different treatment modalities that families use to help their children. But what I did was when my son was about four, I had to take off the mommy hat because the mom hat was emotional wreck. I was the emotional wreck and I had to start thinking like a therapist and I'm a good mm -hmm. therapist. And as a therapist, what I do is I joke around a lot. I know my patients might be uncomfortable with me. That's fine. I always tell them I'm uncomfortable with you. You know, when you say things like that, <laughs> You know, so I, I had to start thinking like a therapist. And as a therapist, I always know my patients can always get better. It's really up to them and their level of faith and the support network that they have. And I had my faith, I questioned it, but I had it. I had my support network and I knew my son could definitely get better. And one thing that I did with my son that I, I tell lots of parents whose children are on the spectrum is stop looking at your child based upon the definition. So I've never raised my son to introduce himself as, hi, I'm Matthew and I have autism. This is not AA meeting. Don't, don't introduce yourself like that. Hi, I'm Matthew, I'm Deji. Okay, let them ask the next question. How old are you? I'm X, Y, Z, good. Let them ask the next question and then you give them the answer, but don't introduce yourself with that title because it doesn't define who you are. Yeah, so, so, so important. These labels can really um, impact our trajectory, right? And I think that's really, really important. Um, yeah. You know, this idea of guilt that you touched on briefly, it's so important to discuss this and really open this up because as parents, we all feel guilt for different reasons, right? And I know on my own journey, having been diagnosed with what proved to be this crazy aggressive cancer at the age of 35 while still nursing my youngest, I assure you, I felt tremendous amounts of guilt for what the impact that that would have had on my children, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll never forget, I had been walking, this was after I was well from cancer, I was walking to the park with my son and he was three at the time, my oldest was at school and a beautiful sunny day, right? We were hand in hand and I had been very well at this point. This was kind of just before my lungs had set in on, on a path of decline. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I had never talked to him about my two month terminal prognosis. Right. But and I was well at this point, I had kind of overcome that part of my story. And at three years old, beautiful day, we were walking to the park and out of nowhere, 
out of nowhere, we hadn't even talked about my health for so long. He squeezed my hand so tight. And at three years old, he looked up and he said, mama, I am not going to let you die. Mm. And I can't imagine, I can't even begin to describe the wave of emotions that all went through my heart, right? In that very moment. But guilt was certainly one. For at three years old, this poor child needs to think about helping protect the survival of his mother, right? And the impact on that was was really hard for me at that time. And the sense of guilt for me getting sick and all that that put my kids through. But I've come to turn that around, right? And, you know, they say that kids that experience adversity as children really thrive as adults through through life in general. They have more empathy, they're more resilient in, 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 in life. But um, I also had to turn that around in the sense that, you know, I was introduced to this idea that our children choose us, yes. right? And um, my children, for whatever reason, chose me on this journey, just as your children chose you to best guide them through this path of autism or whatever else comes their way, they chose you. And just hearing what we've heard already, I just, your children are so lucky, both of your children, to have you by their side. And this is just all really beautiful. Tammy, you, yeah. Oh, sorry. Tammy, you have such a, a wonderful light about you. And thank you for standing in your truth, which is just, I'm sure everyone who's watching is seeing it. Just, it's so bright. And, you know, for all that you shared, I think it's, I'd love to hear just how you kind of reframed this part of your life and how you help others reframe the obstacles that may have been given to them to grow deeper in their life. How do you do that? Okay, I, I don't want to say it's easy, uh, but it is actually easy. And it's it's the mindset thing. It's it's I say it's a choice because you have a choice to either stay in the rut and dwell on the things that you can't change or just look at it and then just look at it, sit back, sit back and say, okay, what, going back to what I was saying earlier about defining yourself as autistic, no. Mm -hmm. What are the limitations that your child has? That's how you start reframing. So what were the limitations that my son had? He was not able to speak, but let's break it down some more. This is where the occupational therapist mother came into play. What were the problems? Okay, he couldn't have conversations. In order to have conversations, you need to be able to speak in sentences. Even when you speak in sentences, you have to be able to understand what the person is saying. Your brain has to be able to process the response. Let's break it down some more. How many words can he put together in a sentence? Let's break it down some more. Does he know the meaning of these simple words? Can he enunciate them properly? Then let's break it down some more can he understand facial expressions without me talking? Mm -hmm. So breaking it down, you see, it's we're talking about having conversations, but you saw how many steps that I broke it down. Mm -hmm. And I had to frame it. So I looked at my son from the perspective of, okay, let's work on the difficulties and the problems that he has, and let's try to work on those. Because when you're able to work on, when, you, when you're able to look at the problems and try to fix the problems, the mm -hmm. major umbrella is just there. It doesn't really matter and it doesn't limit me. It's there, mm -hmm. you know, but you can see the progress. A diagnosis does not give you answers. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. what are the problems that you have when you seek the answers to those problems, you're able to move and progress. Mm -hmm. You look back at that diagnosis and you look back at these are the symptoms and you're like, oh, I had this. Mm -hmm. No, I don't have it anymore. I had that. No, I don't have it anymore. You're able to smile and then you're like, wait a minute, I used to have that. I can't even remember that I used to have that. And that's mm -hmm. because you weren't dwelling on those issues, on, on the diagnosis. You were just focused on what you can do to recover it from those little, little problems that that child has. And that's what I do with my son. Mm -hmm. um, and for I'm going to mention one thing before I forget. For parents who have other children who are not on the spectrum, it's really important to have those children involved. And I'll, I'm gonna make a quick confession. It's also very difficult for parents too because you could fall in one of two traps. One trap could be you love that child that's on the spectrum so much, you could indirectly find yourself resenting in a way, and I hate to say, but it's the truth, the other child. Because it's like, you have everything. You have the friends, you can go out. You, you can attend the parties. 
but your sibling here can because people aren't inviting him or her to the parties. It's it's not something you do consciously, but it's it's something that happens. And if parents that you know they're in this situation are honest with themselves, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a natural thing. It's okay, but we need to be very careful. That's one mm -hmm. area. The other thing could be you might just say, you know what, this is this child with a spectrum. There's only so much that I can do. And then you pour all your focus on your other child or the other children so that they can attain the best in life. And then you know, well, we'll just, you know, figure it out <laughs> with this other child. Mm -hmm. So I, I found that out over the years, like, whoa, what's going on here? You know, and when I realized I quickly had to change, but I got my other son involved. And um, he shared a story. I'm going to quickly share this with you. When my older son was about six years old, I always prayed with my sons together. He asked me one question one night and said, mom, why is it that you ask God, quote unquote, why do you thank God for healing Matthew when he hasn't healed him yet? And he said it with such an attitude. <laughs> and I said, well, simple, because, you know, God is our father and he's going to heal him. And my son, you know, just looked at him like, yeah, right. And I said, okay, you know what? Let me tell you something. Do you remember when you asked dad for your bike, your tricycle? And he was like, uh-huh. I said, do you remember when I told you every day when daddy comes back from work, you should go outside and thank daddy for buying it for you? He said, uh-huh. And I said, what did daddy tell you every day? Daddy always said, why are you thanking me? I haven't bought it yet. I said, exactly. But what did daddy said he was going to do? He'll buy it for me on my birthday. He said, you know, you know how kids are. And I said, hey. And did daddy buy it for you on your birthday? And he was looking into space. Uh-uh. Mm. I said, good. Do you know why? He's like, no. I said, because daddy loves you so much that he didn't want to have, he didn't want to make you wait until your birthday so he got it for you earlier. And that's what God is like. When you ask God for something, he's going to do it for you. So every day, thank him. Because the day he's going to give it to you, you won't even know it. And it'll be a wonderful gift. Well, so I believe, I definitely believe a lot in this future and this idea of future gratitude, right? Yeah. And creating these visualizations and the pathways for that to happen. I think that's a really powerful force. Um, I also want to take it back because we talked a lot about, you know, um, where you where you choose to allocate your focus right in terms of this diagnosis and you're not focused on the label of the diagnosis but you chose to brought it down to each specific choice every day right how can you best serve your child in that moment today and i think that is such a brilliant way of adapting to adversity right not focused on that end point as we all are whether it's me facing cancer whether it's you know whatever we're each navigating right taking that focus off that end goal and really breaking it down to how can i best serve either myself or my children in this moment today and i think that's a really great way of adapting and really um rising to that adversity that you're facing so that was a really great point and really good helper for for parents out there we have a question coming in do you have any advice on dealing with family members who may not understand having a child on the spectrum? Great question. So what I'm guessing this is like aunts, uncles, other families, extended families who aren't in the immediate family. How can we best educate those family members to best serve our kids? Well, for me, uh, my son is the only son, only person and I cannot think of anybody in my generation. When I say my generation, I mean my generation that has that's on the spectrum. I can't. So we were technically, I use the word work, <laughs> or whatever the first and it was hard at first um because a lot of them thought when he first started that i had spoiled him because he just refused to stand he had sensory issues so he refused to stand on the carpets i had to carry him a lot and what i what i did over the years was i just told them you know he was born there was no problem with his delivery, but you know, neurologically things changed. I don't know why hmm. I can't, I can't go back. And this is, these were the things I said, I don't know why things changed with him as a mother. I've done, I did my best as a mother, but things changed and things happen in life. There are things that happen that we can't control. People develop cancer, not because they went and said, I want cancer. And then they took him and they walked away. No, I use that as an analogy. I said, you know, People have accidents, not that they decide to get into their car and drive and hit another car and get into an accident. 
with what happened to my son, I don't know what, I, I cannot explain why, but guess what? The fact that we know that these are the problems he's having, you see, I went back to the problems, not the diagnosis. The fact that he's having you no know, problems with, you know, speaking and being able to have relationships with his cousins, that's, I'm talking about the social skills. Um, you know, we're just gonna be here to help him. And, you know, I'll appreciate if you help him out too, you know, and what, what questions in particular do you have? What, what don't you really understand? So you see, I, I broke it down in a very simplistic form for them to understand that one, I cannot control, or not that I, I, I don't, I cannot control what happened to him, but I can sure as hell control what I can do to help him. Mm. And I ended up asking the next question, what is it in particular that you, know, you, you don't understand or you wanna help me with? And then they'll actually tell you, because a lot of times people hide behind the umbrella of autism. Oh, I heard your son has autism. They really don't understand it, you know, but when you sh share with them that he had the diagnosis, I always say, yeah, he was diagnosed with autism, but these are the problems that he's having. X, mm -hmm. he's not, you know, he, he's having problems, you know, speaking and putting words together. So we're helping with that. And um, he's a little bit shy with the other kids. I'm trying to help the other kids understand how they can help him. Mm -hmm. Oh, then with that, they know, oh, okay speaking and when they talk to your child just knows the way they they speak to your child will be different because you already told them this is the problem that he's having mm -hmm. sometimes the parent the, our family members might not know how to execute helping your child it's okay don't take mm -hmm. it personally don't get frustrated it's not their fault just tell them say this or do that and have them do it i think now, I think that's so great, right? Coming from that point of education and, you know, whether we're talking about autism, cancer, my youngest has type one diabetes. There's a huge misnomer of information out there between type one diabetes and type two diabetes, right? And so always coming back from that source of that point of education and really just um, presenting it as kind of matter of fact, this is where we're at, this is what we do, this is how we eat, this is, you know, and, um, and also opening up that conversation, just as you said, ask me any questions, right? And coming from a point of compassion that sometimes those in our family and those in our surrounding circle, they don't know exactly what to say. So sometimes they're just being a little bit more hesitant, not because they don't wanna know, but just because they don't know what best to say. And so I think it's on us, right, to open up that conversation. So yeah. great, great question from our audience there. Tim, you wanted to ask you, so you know, thank you for all of those incredible insights, which I'm sure are helping so many people who are listening. In back of you are some exquisite paintings, and I know you are an artist, and I would love for you to share with us how your art has been transformative to your son, maybe individuals uh, in your family or your patients. And, and really how that has helped to bring healing and to really be part of a major part of who you are in your work. Oh, well, great, thanks for the question. Um, a few years ago, uh, I say few years ago because it was a few years ago, I, I'm always, I still do it, try to find different techniques and modalities that I can incorporate with teaching my son. Um, and I, in one of the years ago, I was stumbling upon art you know, how art can be used as a treatment modality. Now, I realize a lot of people are talking about art therapy. That's completely different. Mm -hmm. um, my son hates to draw. So art therapy was not an option. <laughs> um, I gave him credit, he hated it. So art was just one of those classes that I used another elective with homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, that's the benefit of homeschooling. <laughs> so uh, I stumbled upon um, some research that a doctor had done where he was trying to figure out how, why, how people were able to reduce their stress levels by up to 60% within the first couple of minutes. And I researched it for months. And mm -hmm. there were some images that he incorporated that he found out that if you incorporate an image in your paintings, they do reduce stress levels. I mm -hmm. dive into further, can these artworks help children who have difficulty with concentrating and focus? Because that was one of the challenges that I had with my son. Mm -hmm. While homeschooling him, a bird could fly. And you know when a bird flies and you're near the window, you can see the, sh the shadow? Mm -hmm. That would automatically distract him. And then it'll take another 10 minutes to get him to focus again. Mm -hmm. So, but that was the best spot to homeschool him because it was well lit and it was comfortable, but it was an easy place where he was distracted. 
Anyway, I found out about this form of art and I'm an artist and I started creating those images. And I started, you know, I hung them near where I homeschooled him on the wall. Mm -hmm. Before long, I noticed that it wasn't an issue. You know, if that bird would fly, he might, you know, look up. And then it was like, because the artwork was there, he'll look back at the artwork and it was bright, you know, bright mm -hmm. color. And then he'll look back down and continue with his work. Did, did you notice what, what I just said right there? It wasn't a matter of me having to redirect him. Mm -hmm. He literally redirected himself. The art was a calming force. Eggs, mm -hmm. it, was, it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So um, I started using that with him and I started painting bigger, you know, pieces. And I was just doing it just because of the fact that, you know what, I also needed it from myself. Um, this was a time that my husband was still undergoing dialysis. Um, mm -hmm. So I needed something that I needed an outlet as mm -hmm. a mother to create because that was the only outlet that I had. Um, and we moved into this house where I have a studio right now where I could work. And um, I noticed that even the, 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 the environment at home was so peaceful. You know, normally I, my husband could say things and I wouldn't get so upset. Mm -hmm. I could say things, he wouldn't get upset. It, it, it was, I sometimes thought, whoa, the, these paintings are doing a number on us because we're just calm, chill. We're not stressed out about anything. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to start painting stress relieving art. And I'll make them in abstracts. I'll make them in naturalistic images as well. But I'll make sure with each image I embed those, or with each painting, I embed those images that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And when people, I'm sorry, there's something in front of my face. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so my goal is for people to see the artwork. And I, are you hearing me? Okay, I'm just having like a double sound here. For people to see the artworks, to connect with it, evoke an emotion, and we'll take it from there. Um, mm -hmm. You might see an artwork and you connect with it and it evokes one kind of emotion. To somebody else that's seeing the same artwork, it evokes another kind of emotion. But the emotions are all geared to be positive, inspiring, motivational. Um, and I'm just so happy that I get to do that. Um, professionally as an artist and I use it for my clients, you know, who have, you know, explained that they're having different levels of stress mm -hmm. and it's not doing stress, it's not doing art therapy, but just sitting in the environment where the artwork is and just seeing how they change when they're just having conversations. I know it's doing what it's supposed to do. Right. And I think one of the things that you said, it, it was so beautiful is you said, I needed the outlets. And I think, you know, when you're a caregiver, as you were for your husband and your son, the stresses, you also have to take care of yourself. And I think probably one of the reasons those paintings did have a common effect because you were probably putting a lot of that emotion into those paintings as well. And But it's just a really important reminder that the caregivers always need to care for themselves too. And that yes. is a beautiful witness. So thank you for sharing that. Thank really you. great feedback, Ryan. Really great. Thank you. So um, these are some of the paintings that I have here. Um, do, would you like to see them? Sure. Okay. I'm going to move the camera, so don't get dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. Um, let's see. Let me do my... Okay. Wow. So this piece here is called Peak. Let me do this. It's called Peak. Um, it actually just sold a couple of days ago. This was the painting that I stood in front of when I announced that I had alopecia. Hmm. <laughs> uh, this painting, let me see here, let me put it this way. This one over here is called Flame. Hmm. And um, the story behind this basically was, I was just thinking about how God had healed my son. I went into my studio and I thought, you know, he died for us on the cross. He took away all our sins. And when I did this, this actually represents the blood of Christ when he was ascending into heaven. And um, so I call it flame. Uh, this painting over here, sorry about that. Uh, let me see my finger. <laughs> over here is called uh, Mon Amour, which means my love in French. Uh, let me see here, let's see. Okay, can you, I don't know if you can see that one, but I'm gonna turn this around over here like this. Can you see this one? Beautiful. Yes. This piece here, 
sorry, that's my light, my ring light. Uh, <laughs> uh, but this is a lamb of Judah, a uh, line of Judah. And uh, I've got some other paintings around here, but I'll have to literally take the camera off the computer and. Uh, well, thank you for showing those. Yeah, as you that was great. Those. Yeah, I saw one of your paintings online uh, called Evolution, which obviously the name of my company, Evolution, Evolution. I loved it immediately. It was great. So you're extremely uh, gifted. And thank you for sharing that gift with us today. Yeah, that's thank beautiful, so Tammy. Thank you so much. It's it's a pleasure. And I'm, I thank God I can do it. And um, I, I just want to help other caregivers to know, you know, it's it's OK, but we can't give up on ourselves because if we don't take care of our own mental health, our own being, who else is going to take care of those people that we love so much and we're giving our all to? But once we can take care of ourselves, we're able to function mm -hmm. at our best. And we're able to help that person that really needs us and depends on us. But we should also make sure we have our own support network and not be afraid to ask for help, not be afraid to just take a break. Go to the bathroom and take a 10 minute break is what I say sometimes. I mean, no one is going to disturb you when you're there and just breathe, relax and mm -hmm. give yourself some grace. You know, you're doing a great job, you know, and and always smile. Just look in that mirror and just love that person that you see. And Tammy, you're, you're, you're such a great example of um, prioritizing life, right? right? Ahead of the diagnosis. I think I've got a second sound coming in. Sorry about that. I don't know how to fix it. Um, right? In terms of prioritizing life ahead of that diagnosis, whatever it may be, whether it's autism, whether it's cancer, whether it's your husband's kidney disorder, right? Whether in my case, it's type 1 diabetes. We all face hurdles. At the end of the day, pain is pain, hurt is hurt, and grief is grief. And that, that fundamentally connects us all. And I remember hearing when my son was first diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, right? Right now, it's like this big cloud right? And it's all consuming. But as you get better at navigating this, you know, that cloud is smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller to the point it's not even a cloud, right? And life life is big, right? Again. Yeah. And so in those early days of facing something new, facing that new challenge, know that, you know, once you educate yourself and once you get back on that path, that that prioritize that life ahead of the diagnosis all the time. And I think that's a phenomenal example. You are a phenomenal example of doing just that. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, Tammy, can you please tell me how can our how can our viewers get in touch with you? Gosh, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening on this. How can our viewers how can our viewers get in touch with you? Uh, well, there the one way is if you go on Instagram. Um, I do have an account on Instagram, and it's Timmy, T E M I underscore Modern Art. And you can always DM me directly through there if you you know ask me whatever questions. I'm very accessible and I'm very open and I think you can tell them very nice. <laughs> so I always, you know, get back in touch with them through there. Um, other avenues is, you know, they can always go on my Facebook business page, which is Timmy Fine Arts, um, Modern Contemporary, and, you know, communicate with me through that forum. They can also go on my website, uh, which is Timmy Fine Arts. And you can always send me a message through by filling out the contact form. But a quick and easy way is just going through Instagram because that's instantly. And um, and I think it's it's worldwide because if you have any issues with internet connections, just get on Instagram Great. and I'll reach back as soon as possible. Great. Temi, can you leave our audience with one closing remark to help them rise through similar adversity? Yes. Um, and what else? Okay. You were faithfully and fearfully made. You're not a mistake. Every challenge and obstacle that you are facing, you are facing it for a reason. And that is because you are more than able to overcome it. So take the time, don't overanalyze, break it into pieces, overcome each challenge one at a time. And when you do, celebrate it. Celebrate every advancement, celebrate every change. Because when you celebrate that, when the bigger things come, it'll be so much easier. And just know that everything you're going through is to bless somebody else that's behind you. Hmm. So give yourself some grace and God bless you. Ah, oh, so beautiful. Thank you, Tammy. What an absolute honor to meet with you and learn more about you and your inspiration and hope, hope that you have given today. So thank you. 
so much. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. And thank you so much, Dr. Erica. Ah, thank you. You're both amazing, Brian. You're also amazing, Brian. You're also too. Thank you. Thank you, Temi, so, so much. We hope you have found inspiration by this show, Risers and Thrivers. And Temi, thank you so, so much. We will be back with you next Tuesday. Stay tuned. All the best, Risers. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.